Something that you said really resonated with me, and it's something that I think a lot of authors really need to look at even before they get to that editing stage, even before they write that first book. It's, are you going to do this as a hobby? Is this just something that that you love and you want to do and you feel the need to write? Or is this something that you're really going to put the time and the effort in to make it a business? to make it a career and something viable that you're going to be able to support yourself and your family. Because how you approach it, um, everything after you write, even during you uh, during your writing, um, your beta readers, your, um, your self-editing phases, your arc readers, the editor that you choose, all of that is based on that decision. And if you don't know where you want to take it, you're just gonna, you're gonna fumble. And I think that's a huge, huge step that authors miss a lot of times. Welcome to Horror Business. Tonight we have a special guest, Lindsay Smith, owner of Lindsay Smith Editing, is here to talk with us about not only the process of editing and why it's so important and some of the big questions authors need to ask themselves, um, but also she's going to talk about ghostwriting, which is something that's been extremely fascinating to me, uh, and we've had a lot of questions about it. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it. Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about your background um, and then what services you offer? Um, sure. Hi. Everybody, um, so I have Horace Smith editing. Um, a few of you have spoken to me over the years. Um, I've been in the business for uh, on a more professional level for about three years now. Um, but before that, I've actually been writing since I was in the fourth grade. It's just it's something that I've always done. It's what I majored in in college. Um, I actually graduate in December with my second degree. Um, and then I start my second editing certificate. Um, I have one already through Writer's Digest. Um, I go in for my next one with the uh, University of California um, in January. And then I start my master's in publishing in next August. Um, so I, I a lot of school. Oh man, a lot of school. Um, but I can honestly say that even even through all of that, I've learned the most just through on the job um, and, and working with the editors that I have in my network, working with the authors who have given me the extreme honor of being able to work with them. Um, for my company started out as just horror editing. That's what I wanted to do. That's my favorite genre in the entire world. Um, I, I love the people. I love the community. I love the books. I love anything that scares me. Um, <laughs> and, and they've definitely scared me. Um, I offer everything. I offer ghostwriting, um, something that we call substantive editing. That's a step above developmental editing. Um, I offer developmental editing, which um, some people know also as content editing. I offer line and copy editing, proofreading, um, beta reading, blurb writing, um, manuscript evaluations, um, the, uh, it, the entire spectrum. I've been trained on all of it. You're on the whole gamut. Um, can I ask maybe just um, with some of the terms like developmental or um, substantial line, could you just do a quick breakdown for maybe some of the newer authors who might sure. not know what they're looking for an editor? Sure. Um, so th this is this is huge. And it, it's something that I think a, a lot of authors genuinely need to understand before they are looking for an editor. You absolutely have to know what your book needs in order to find the right editor for you. Um, if you've never worked with an editor before, I would say opt for a manuscript evaluation. And this is where the editor is going to be looking at your work. They're going to tell you the strengths and the struggles of your narrative arc, meaning your storyline from your hook through the middle, making sure it doesn't fall flat. Um, all the way to um, what we call a satisfactory conclusion, meaning if you have met every single um, punch of your trope, if you have 
wrapped up all of your plots and your um, your subplots, your your major narrative arc um, into a satisfactory ending to where your readers are not left with any questions unless you're writing a series. Um, and, and the editor is going to take all that into consideration. Um, and then they're going to guide you on what other services you need. Um, if you need something that's called a developmental edit, that's going to mean that there's something wrong with the story itself. Um, this is where we look at your story from an eagle eye, meaning I will look um, to make sure your hook is effective. I will look to make sure your narrative arc is followed through each chapter that it progresses, that anything that happens not only enriches your character development to where their actions are relatable and understandable. Um, nothing comes out of the blue. Nothing leaves readers wondering, huh? Um, we, we iron all of that out. Substantive editing is where, as the author, I take a more, or not the author, whoo, as an editor, I take <laughs> more of a hands-on approach with that. So instead of giving it back to you and saying, here, fix these things, I help you and I hold your hand and I fix it with you. Um, so so that's a little bit more, that's, that's usually more for the newer authors who need a little bit more um, of a push. Line and copy editing is it. I, some editors make those go in two separate tiers. I put them all in one um, just because I, I find it easier for myself to do it all together. But that's just where I help um, polish any awkward sentencing, um, any misused words, any misused punctuation, um, lay and lie. We all have our. Yeah. our that. <laughs> um, so that's where I handle that. And proofreading is where you've already sent it to an editor. Um, someone's already looked at it. You've already had everyone, your beta readers look at it. You've already had it formatted. Everything is completely done and you're ready to publish it and you just need one more look. And, and I'm your last line of defense before you publish it and you send it off into the world. That wasn't brief. I'm really sorry. And we're no, that's I apologize. <laughs> it's important. It's not a brief thing. And I think, as you said earlier, it's important that authors get that. Um, sometimes you see the turnaround on some of these books. And maybe this was all happening while the author was working on the next book. And it was almost like a rotated cycle. So it only seems like they're putting it out super quick. When mm -hmm. meanwhile, it's been rotating. But I think uh, a lot of authors don't think of all that. And it is going out into the world um, super early. Um, yes. Now, there think, is uh, a that though um one of the things that i do because i write in cozy mystery and romance as well as horror and those are genres that lean better into the rapid release is what we call that where someone mm -hmm. releases every month or every three weeks something like that and what we're taught to do is to write ahead of time so before you ever plan on releasing that first book write three or four of them, get them into the editing phase, and then you're just able to constantly release them. And then you maintain the quality, but you're right. Some authors don't do that, and they should. Is that like, a, <laughs> like that's fascinating. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, why, why do you think, why do you think the steps are skipped? Um, I, I think a lot of people look at it like, I can't afford an editor, so I don't need it. Um, I've been in a lot of beginner author groups where people say, you don't need an editor until you're successful. Well, you're not going to be successful if you don't get an editor. So um, it, it's kind of a catch 22. And, and I think that, and, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about, you have to decide why you're writing. Are you intending for this to be a hobby and you think it's fun to where you can, you know, just have your high school English teacher look at your work and that's good? Or is this going to be a business that you expect to be profitable? So in that case, you do need to invest the money and, and, and plan ahead. And um, it, it's also something you have to plan ahead for marketing. It, it, it's a lot more extensive. And I, I think that a lot of authors have the misconception that writing 
is all all there is that all editors do is run it through pro writing aid when we do so much more than that and you know the the work shows it so so how i wanted to know how you speaking of treating things as a business how you grew this as a business uh. <laughs> <laughs> I need a drink. Hold on. <laughs> My throat. I'm sorry. Um, so it's not alcoholic. I'm not gonna. <laughs> um, okay. So it was really funny how I got into it. Actually, I was one of those authors who, when I first first started, I was, I, I was one of those authors that thought. I knew everything. You know, I thought I did really, really great in English in high school. I did really great in college. I've got this. I've got this. And then I published my first book and I realized I didn't got this. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I didn't. And so I, I started looking for an editor and I realized, oh man, editors are expensive. Oh boy. Okay wasn't planning on this. What am I going to do? And I went from being a stay at home mom because of my husband, he's in the military. We moved around too much for me to have a career. And I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to teach myself how to be an editor. And I did it. Um, I invested in my first one was a 10 week course. My, cert my first certification was a 10 week course. Afterwards, I have put in 162 continuing education hours um, across all tiers of editing. Um, and that was before I started charging my clients. Um, before that, I was doing free work um, just for, hey, give me a testimonial, let me edit your work. And that's what I did. And every single one of those clients from years ago still uses me. So um, from there, word of mouth. Um, if you treat people right and if you, you have a passion for what you do and you take your time and you put in the effort and, uh, you know, if you're professional and... The, the quality speaks for itself and word gets around. And I, I think that how I approach people, uh, I, I try to, I, everyone's a friend to me. <laughs> um, everyone is someone that I just want to help. And they're, th my clients are my team. I, I don't see them as, as a, a paycheck or an income. Um, their successes are truly my successes. I promote them anytime I can. I, I, I just, I want the best for them. And I think that, I honestly think that just that mindset has been what's, what's grown me. Um, that there, there hasn't been any, I, I wish I had some business plan that I could give you that you guys could share and be like, here's the roadmap to success. But I think for me, it was just trying to be what I would want to see in the business. That's exactly what makes people successful. <laughs> I think the people that Lucy and I have talked to have done that. It's been a slow process of treating people right, being patient, investing yes. in themselves. Um, one of the things we had talked about to plug a, an earlier episode was telling authors right away, as you said, if you want to do this as a career, think about how you're going to structure it as a true business. The investment, um, not necessarily as an LLC, but maybe as a professional so that you can have tax write-offs and how to plan out your year. That's all the steps that people take. So that, that's perfect advice. Um, um, since you are a writer yourself, um, how do you, what's the hardest part, I guess, for you? separating your two your two selves so you're an author but you're also an editor and one of the things i noticed when i started working on my first anthologies i was told by a mentor um don't change somebody's story to what you would have done just make theirs shine so i don't know if you have any tips of how you separate yourself how you make someone else shine and and not be your uh writing voice um yeah that you know to be really honest that comes with training um okay. if 
that that's actually something that I've seen be the main complaint when people work with editors who haven't had any training. If it's someone who was a beta reader and decided that uh, I find a lot of errors, so I, I, I'm an editor. I want to be an editor now because mm -hmm. our industry is not regulated. Um, we don't have any type of association that monitors us and, and, and gives us some kind of standard. Um, you guys could set up an editing service tomorrow and start editing for clients and no one would know the difference. And, and that's really unfortunate. Um, but for me, mainly it's, I, when you're going through someone's work and you're looking for, um, any kind of sentence structure, because where where the author's voice would change is in the actual sentence structure, their their syntax, um, their their cadence and, and the flow. And some of them like to use fragments. Some of them don't. Um, some of them like to use um, what I call stream of consciousness writing, where you should use commas. Um, a, an English teacher would mark you up and you need commas here and here. But if you understand what the writer is trying to say and the emotions they're trying to evoke, you know that that's not how that goes. And so it's you you genuinely have to put yourself into that work and and feel the words and that writer. And I, I really try to work with people that I've spoken to a lot ahead of time that um, that I know I go through and I read the work before I get started on it. So I'm not in my headspace. I'm not in to the novel I was writing. Um, I, I'm entirely in that client's work and it, it, it's a lot easier that way. Plus I read a lot. So I, it's so much easier for me to to sit back and I have my designated writing time and my muse knows that's when I write and I don't write any other time. And so it's really easy for me to switch it off because that's what I'm trained to do. As I noticed on Facebook, we had a couple <laughs> stuff, too. So let me let me pull these from it, uh, see if I can combine here because a couple of these are the same. But it looks like um, if you could speak on. What are maybe some of the common issues, you might have touched on this a bit before, that you see in books? Maybe like the three most common things that if authors just took a little bit more time, they could eliminate it. Um, and possibly what's something that you wish authors knew before they approached an, an editor? Um, <laughs> they're so mean. Okay. So much, so much to, <laughs> to sift yeah. through. Okay, so are you talking like errors actually within the book? Or do you mean just how authors approach things? Because the two kind of go hand in hand, I think. I would love to hear you say hand in hand then a bit because I think that'll count. Okay. <laughs> no clarification on that okay. Facebook question. Okay. It, it was Joe. Shame on him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. Oh, you've me. seen the questions too. <laughs> At me. Yes. Um, so I, I think honestly, and I think I've touched upon this already, but it's absolutely huge that I think a lot of authors go into this thinking that the absolute hardest part and where they can put their pen down and be done with the book is after they've written it. And that's quite honestly the easiest part. Um, there's so much more after that that I think if the author keeps that mindset and they plan ahead and they don't rope themselves into deadlines, um, I had a client recently. I love him. He's wonderful. Um, and I, we laugh about it now, but he gave me a 400 word book or 400,000 word book Whoa. with three days before the pre-order. Oh, so, man. I, I love him. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was four. It was four. It was four days before his pre-order deadline, because you have to get it in three days before for a pre-order, or you lose your ability to pre-order for an entire year. I had four days to do a book that should have been three books. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't plan ahead. 
Um, uh, writing the deadlines have always hurt me. I found myself <laughs> foolishly agreeing to something and I shouldn't have. And I, I've been regretful that I think maybe the work was not as good as it could have been, but yet I hit this deadline and I don't, I don't know that it was worth it. So yeah, See, exactly. It, it's, it's not because you, you have to figure out that like the only people that you're letting down when you do that or when you approach your work that way, you're putting the readers down, like you're, you're letting them down and the, you know, they're the ones that are going to be purchasing your book. They're the ones that, that may be their first impression of you. Um, and they may not be, you know, the, the type of reader that comes back if they've decided that they didn't like your work. So you could have missed out on someone who could have absolutely fallen in love with your best effort and bought your entire library. And, and those are the kind of readers you want. So, you know, one of the things I always tell my clients is to just slow down. You know, it, it is okay. It is 100% okay to to not rush, to, to not put out, a, a, not to rush and put out a book and have it be less than your best. Like it, it always needs to be your best, especially if you want to make something of this business. Like that, that's, it's so huge. It is. Yeah, I see that a lot and I've been so curious about it because I do see people putting out things like rapid fire. Um, mm -hmm. so there are people just like, it, it's, I don't know how they write that fast. Like I, I just, I just don't, I don't know how, I don't know how it's possible and I know that I know that I hold my, like everything that I put out, I I'm like, I'll read it like six times or something, you know, <laughs> before putting anything out. So it may, as so I was thinking like, do people, do they, do they just write faster than me or do they, do they put it out without, you know, the, the, the extensive self-criticism? Um, and it's been, it's been interesting because you do see a lot of people who are able to put things out and they are able to achieve more success with it. But I was just curious, like, um, just because I've never, I've never seen this so much in like in, in anything else in other, any other form of art, um, mm -hmm. people put things out so rapidly and I'm just wondering, yeah, from your experience and from what you've seen, like, is it a good, it, it, is it a good idea or is there like a compromise in between? Um, yeah, it's funny you say that. Um, I can usually write a book in about three days. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word count on that before you go further? Is that like a probably between my my cozy mysteries are about fifty to sixty. Um, my horror tends to be more seventy eighty. Um, and I, I will tell you my secret, and it's huge. Okay. And I, I I tell everybody, and everyone laughs at me, and okay. I, I swear by it. Writing sprints. What's that? You don't know what that is? No. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. Okay. What? So, so writing sprints. I love them. I swear by them. You will be the most productive you've ever been. Um, okay. So um, for a set aside, and, and this even works if you have a day job and you literally only have 15 to 30 minutes a day to write. Like you can write every single day. I've seen some people who only write on the weekends because they have a day job. You don't have to do that. It works in your lunch break. It's fantastic. Um, so take 15 minutes to an hour, um, whatever's most comfortable for you and put aside absolutely everything. Close out my voice. Um, close out your emails, turn your phone on silent, um, make sure everyone in your house knows that you need to be left alone for however long that increment is. Um, have absolutely nothing up on your computer except for the writing program you use. TV off, nothing, nothing okay. can bother you. Um, and then just write. Write as fast as you can. Don't worry about going back to correct typos. Don't worry about... Um, going back, if you um, mistyped something, just keep going. Do not go back. Just go. And you will find that you can write so much more in that length of time. And it, it's not, you'd be surprised 
how much time you waste going back. And you're, we all go through self-editing phases anyway, right? So mm -hmm. what I do is I do hour long writing sprints. Well, 50 minutes really, because I give myself a 10 minute break to check email because I, you know, I don't want my clients to be upset with me if I'm not responding. Um, so I, I'll give myself a 10 minute interval and then, and then I'll do another 50 minutes, 10 minute interval, another 50 minutes. Um, I do that for four hours a day. I can usually max out about nine to 10,000 words a day if I do that. Oh. Okay. And then I, I let it sit for a day. I go back. I have a little bit of time set aside each day. Well, I will go back and I'll edit my own work. I'll go back and make sure everything sounds how I want it. I portray it exactly how I want it. And I, I've not wasted as much time going, you know, trying to backspace, 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 trying to fix all of my corrections while I'm working. So it, oh. it's, it, it, it's great. You will get. I won't laugh at that. I think that's legitimate for sure. Yeah, um, really and sad. again, again, it sounds like discipline, which is something that I sometimes lack when I'm. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely have. I've been guilty of if I hit a hard scene, the phone suddenly comes out for a second. I'm like, well, I'm sure there's someone I have to get back to. And <laughs> yeah, that makes nope. sense. So I want to run this by you. This is my wacky way that I wrote um, my upcoming novel first mm -hmm. draft because it actually mm -hmm. kind of sounds like I'm it kind of sounds like I'm in the right place based on what you just said. So, and I started doing this in, obviously there's much longer lead time because I started doing this in like April, 2020 when everything was shut down, March, 2020. Mm -hmm. I just had this little notebook and I was laying in bed. I had this idea for the book and it was right before I was about to go to sleep and I would do, you know, it was sprint. Like I'm not very distracted at, at night. Like I wouldn't have any music on. My phone would be away. It's always on silent after like 9.30 anyway. And um, so I would, I would just write scribbled because you can't go back when you're writing in pen anyway. So I just scribble. It's like barely legible, but I'd write for anywhere from like 10 to 30 minutes to whenever either my hand got really tired or I started like sitting there and thinking. And then I was like, okay, my creativity's done. I'm, I'm going to go to sleep now. So, and that was probably the most, the fastest I've ever written anything. Uh -huh. And obviously I had to do a typing after that. Like I had to type it all up, which was major self editing there. And, right. um, but it, it sounds like that was actually like I stumbled upon you did. like remedial version of your sprinting. <laughs> your sprint. no, like my not even version. writing it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but yes, that that's a hundred percent what it is. And you're right. If you just and, and if you train yourself to write at the same time every single day, and this is something that Stephen King actually touches upon in his um, on writing the the book. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know a horror author who hasn't read that book yet, um, but he he actually mentions that he writes every single day between a certain amount of time, but he only goes until he reaches a certain word count. I do it on a timed basis, like from this time to this time, because I am a multi-genre author, so I have a lot more reader expectation to meet as far as releases. Um, so I, I do that. But um, yeah, you will. It, it's amazing how much you can put out. And if you train yourself that you're going to write in that space of time that you've allotted yourself, you'll find that your brain just automatically kicks in with the creativity. It's and wow. if, if you've never done the writing sprints before and you've never trained yourself for a specific time, I always suggest to my clients to just sit there and write nonsense. Don't even have it be a book that you're working on. Just type whatever's in your mind and it'll Same. get your brain attuned to that. It's it's great. Yeah, you're I think you're right about it, too, because I started I did this just like. I don't know why I started doing it, but I did. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then I have like I've been way more productive since writing that with um, mm -hmm. things things that I put out after that, and I have done most of it in that same fashion, where mm -hmm. I've written it in like scribbles and notebooks and everything. So I I do think, and I, I kept saying to people when they ask about like writing processes and, and things like that, anytime I answer a question, I'm just like, I was like, 
chaos, but like <laughs> there might be some <laughs> rationale to it. You know? <laughs> but, There's a word for it. <laughs> yeah, but like, okay, well, apparently and I've, I've realized this just in like the last two years, like, well, I guess I'm really creative, like at night and, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, so I, I think I, I, I found this by accident, but if my, my weird way of doing this shows that I think you're dead on. I think that's I think that's probably the way to be most productive. And and as you're saying, maximizing creativity at the time of day when you have either trained yourself or when you naturally have your most creative energy. Yeah. It's controlled chaos. <laughs> okay. I've just been sitting in chaos. I forgot to control it. I, I don't want to talk about any process I have. Let's move on to ghost, ghost writing. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's say this is maybe more of a generic question if an author's okay. like yes i do want to approach an editor you have convinced me i want to do this um what is something they need to know maybe <laughs> when looking for an editor because there's tons of people out there and basically it's just like i happen to be in a writing group so i'll just say hey who here do you suggest and you might get a hundred different people and so how do you shift through what um, are we looking for when we um, hire someone? um you're going to want to look um, I always say to find an editor who specializes in your genre. Um, there are editors like me who have multiple specializations because we've just centered our clients magically um, yeah. into, into those little tropes and, and those genres. And you really want them because they know what the reader expectation is for the genre that you're writing in. Um, mm -hmm. They know if you've met tropes, they know if you've, um, if you could push it further, um, if you can do like a, a slightly more unique spin, um, they're going to have the best perspective, um, especially from a developmental standpoint. Um, line and copy editing, if that's what you're needing, um, you're definitely going to want to get a sample edit. Um, some editors who have been in the industry for um, like 20 plus years, a lot of them charge for the sample edits um, and, and that's okay. Um, if they do, they'll charge their normal rate and then they'll take that amount off of the actual book because they've already mm -hmm. edited, you know, a couple of the pages. Um, but always, 100% always get that sample edit. Even get a sample edit from an editor that you know is outside of your price range. And I okay. say this because not not all editors who are on the higher level, not all of them are great. They're, they're not. I mean, but in some of the editors who are who charge very, very low rates, that doesn't mean that their quality isn't as good either. So this will get you a huge spectrum. You'll be able to see where each of the editor falls skill wise. Um, if they're all like if you find an editor who wants to charge you three hundred dollars for your book and then you have another editor who wants to charge you three thousand and that three hundred dollar editor has, you know, is finding all the same consistent errors chances are they're just as good. They just maybe have just started out in their career and, and that's fine. Um, but a sample edit is really going to show you if that editor is able to retain your voice. Um, editing is entirely subjective. How I edit is entirely different from how Ellen Datlow edits. She's amazing, but it's, it's just our perspective. Um, it's um, some editors like you to edit that out of your, you know, your stories. Some editors prefer it. Um, some editors want you to take as out. Some editors like it. Um, it it's, it's entirely different how we approach things. Um, and our, our training is different. Um, some of them are more, more traditional grammar, some are very pro Oxford comma, it, it's entirely different. And you have to find the editor that has the style that fits with you and who you mesh with because your relationship with that editor is going to make or break your success. And so it's that sample edit, so important. I think that was all my editing questions. So <laughs> yeah, thank I, you. No problem. So too. <laughs> um yeah oh the one more one more sorry okay. what are uh, the <laughs> the most 
when you're when you're retained as an editor, and I don't want to talk about it in any in any hand, the substantive, the the de- developmental, and then the line and copy editing. What are the most common issues that you see? Like, like what what are the things that can if authors address them before they send it to you, they can get better rates on editing because it's not going to take you as long. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Okay. Could, <laughs> Giving away all my secrets. No, um, <laughs> no, no I, I, I love this because for me, actually, I charge by word. I don't charge by hour. So, um, and I also don't have, um, my, my rates aren't drastically different if someone has an extremely heavy, heavy, heavy edit versus one who's a little bit lighter. Um, I, I do have a little bit of a range, but but not not too bad, not like some editors do. Yeah. Um, okay. Some editors will completely make you jump a tier of editing mm-hmm. if that's the case. Um, so uh, what I advise clients to do if they really want to work better at self-editing um, is to go through your document and take out every single instance of that. Every time, no matter what, take it out. Um, then when you go back and you're rereading it, just reword the sentence. But usually it's just a matter of flipping what came after the that to the front of the sentence. To, to completely eliminate the need for the word. Um, also kind of go through when you're rereading your work and look and see if you have the same verb or the same description um, mentioned multiple times within the same sentence. Um, so like if you say that they consumed this and then two lines later they consumed it again they can do something other than consume. So use a different word um, that, that'll hold up your reader. Um, anything like he saw, he felt, there's thunder, I apologize. Um, he saw, he felt, um, any of those he heard, that takes away from the impact of your writing. Um, it, instead of he heard the bells, well, what did the bells do? The bells, chimed like that that creates more action it, it's it's putting the reader there not making them see it through the character's eyes which kind of takes away some of the impact um we call those filler words and that that'll cut down your word count you you would be surprised how often authors do that um also look for tense shifts um if you have Obviously, if you have a flashback or a memory, your tense is going to shift. Um, but it, it, it doesn't do that frequently. Um, you, most people don't have that a lot in their writing. Um, and so if you just watch for those, if you if you use um, the Microsoft Word read aloud feature, that'll tell you if if something doesn't sound right and you'll hear it. Um, instead of just seeing it on paper, sometimes it's really easy to skip over. Um, that'll help you with awkward phrasing as well, because if it sounds weird when you hear it, it's going to sound weird in the reader's mind when they read it. Um, so that's huge. That's something I always, always tell, tell my authors to do that too. Um, that there's, oh gosh, there's so many lay and lie. (laughs) I'll go back to that one. And that's a hill I will die on. That is the worst, the absolute worst. Lie is what you do. Lay always has an object. You lay a pillow on the ground, but you lie on the pillow. Keep that in mind. (laughs) (laughs) These are good gems. I like it. (laughs) Man. All right. So they just, that that's, there you go. Behind the scenes, the editor advice, this is what you do. Um, I've noticed that just recently on the, that's, um, going back through, that's a self-edit one that I need to get better about. Mm -hmm. Um, I love it. Another one. Another one. I'm so sorry. This is huge. Okay. So you don't always have to say, he said, 
she said. You don't always have to say that. Mm -hmm. That is invisible to readers. Readers are less likely to see he said versus he whined. So it so if you're going to use a dialogue tag like that, make sure that they're unique. Um, if you absolutely have are running out of unique things to say, um, he said is great, but you don't always need it on every single time. Try to use an action tag. So how did he say it? What did he do? Did he stomp his feet? Did he cross his arms? Um, did he look out the window while he did it? What did he do? You know, as if you have a character's mm -hmm. action tag right there, the reader's going to know that they were the one who said it. Um, and always put multiple character dialogue in their own paragraphs. I will get yeah. off my soapbox now. <laughs> 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 no, no, that's a huge one. I like that. Those are um, big. <laughs> those are. Okay, then here we'll go to the next huge topic, the ghost writing that you do. Um, yes. I, I have tons of questions on it, but um, I guess, <laughs> how did you get into it? And what is ghost writing? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, so ghost writing is pretty much where I take someone else's idea that they give me permission to take mm -hmm. And um, it, it can kind of come across as, as multiple ways. They can either give me an idea. Um, they can talk to me about what happens in this chapter, or they can give me an outline. And I write it and give it to them for approval. Um, and essentially, it becomes an entire book that way. Um, and different authors handle that different. Some of them have timelines some of them don't care um it kind of depends on who you're ghostwriting for um so i got into it because i stumbled across a group of domestic abuse survivors who wanted their stories to get out there so that way other women or men who had experienced domestic abuse um who knew they weren't alone and so, like, family members who had someone going through that, so that way they could, if that person wasn't ready to talk about it or if they hadn't broken away from their abuser yet, they, they could read this book and understand what their loved one was going through um, and, and possibly understand how to react to some of the things that they would say or do after they had left the abuse situation. Um, and so I got into it from that. Um, and then that branched off into me offering it to fiction writers. Um, so I've seen it from both sides. And, and wow. it's drastically different for both sides. <laughs> yeah. What an was, amazing way to enter the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have a question, too. So so about ghostwriting. So you're saying, like, it's it might just be, like, a chapter in a book. Like, an author will have, like, a 36-chapter book and they'll have written some of them or they're sending it to you chapter by chapter and it's almost like collaborative but your name isn't on it is that it, it can be all of it yes okay. um, there um one of my cozy mystery authors that i helped ghostwrite with um hers was chapters that she needed help with that she needed um she needed to add an element to it that that wasn't added in the previous publication of it. And so she hired me to go back through and add the different chapters that would help the series arc later. And so I added those. Um, I have had, um, for, on the more horror aspect, it was someone who English was not the first language. And so um, that one was more, he gave me a raw book that was, it had no dialogue. It was just, um, you know, they had a conversation about this, 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 and then I made it into the full-fledged book. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, for my domestic abuse survivors, what I usually do is, um, I, I'm, I have a psychology 
background. And so um, I'm actually, that's my major that I'm graduating with in December is forensic psychology. Um, and so I, I, I do have that. I'm, I'm not going to pursue a career in that at all, which is really funny and sounds like a total waste of time and money. But it, it's actually helped me with this because I, I speak to them and because I have that horror background and because I have the psychology background, the places that they go are very dark. The things that they have experienced are out of a horror novel. And so we will listen. We will have weekly phone conversations where they tell me the next segment of their story and their trauma. And I take that and I put that into word form. Um, for them and it's usually in first person so I have to convey their emotions and and everything that happened and so I have to put myself in in their place um, those are a lot harder and I will only take one of those at a time because it's it's really really hard to get emotionally invested or it's really easy to get very emotionally invested in those um, but yeah I, I wouldn't stop doing it they the stories need to be heard but yeah <laughs> that's the only non or yeah that's the only non-fiction i do everything else is fiction uh if someone if an author wanted to find some legitimate ghost writing gigs in the first place or how would you pitch yourself for one so um again i don't know the background of this question maybe this is an author who just wants to take a break from his own work for a bit um what would you do if you wanted to get into this uh <laughs> Maybe at a, at a fictional level rather than you're, you have a, that's a very unique story. Well, maybe I don't know if it's a unique story. I don't know how most people get into ghostwriting, but yeah, how would they pitch themselves? Okay. Um, so for fiction authors, um, like one of the more recent authors that I spoke to about um, a ghostwriting position, um, this person had a deadline and they wanted um, multiple examples of my work. And they're, depending on the genre that you're looking for, um, they're going to want specific examples of your work that convey aspects of that genre's tropes. Um, like, for instance, this was a fantasy um, genre book. And so they wanted, um, they wanted examples of fight scenes. They wanted examples of romantic scenes. Um, and they wanted examples of just normal everyday writing. Um, mm -hmm. And so that that's something that you're going to want to have prepared. You're going to want to have a website, obviously, um, for anyone to be able to contact you and come back and see your work. You're not always going to be able to tell clients your work. Um, so it that's best. Uh, that's a really good place to to put your examples um, that you've written so they can see different parts of your work because there I've signed a lot of NDAs. I can't always tell you who yeah. I've written for. And so that that's a problem that ghostwriters have is we can't always say, oh, well, I wrote this bestseller and this award-winning book and this. Well, you can't say that because you're outing that author. You can't do that. Right. So um, NDA, and, just in case anyone didn't know, is a non-disclosure agreement? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I can't, unless a client has given me permission, I cannot tell the book um okay. and, and you know i understand that so um and there there are places if you really want to get started um there's places like upwork um I, I i try to steer away from upwork um you're not going to get paid what your work is necessarily worth um okay. that is mainly if you are willing to do something for just the exposure, just a testimonial, um, just for the experience, just so you can learn the ropes, get familiar, um, grow your own examples. Um, that that's a that's a good basis. Um, another way is to join the author groups that we keep discussing. There are a lot. Um, there. Um, for editors just starting out, there's editing ones and there are ghostwriting ones for people who are looking for that. Um, I know I've been in some author groups recently where I have seen people say, hey, you know, this really well-known author is looking for a ghostwriter because she 
wants to branch off into another genre and another trope, but she doesn't want to let this reader base die. So Mm -hmm. can someone pick up her writing schedule? Um, I've seen some people take over writings, um, unfinished series for other authors who have passed away. Um, that, that's a really unfortunate thing, but, um, it's helpful. It it helps, it helps the readers. It's a great tribute to the author. Um, and and so just keep on the lookout for those things. Um, and it's really about educating the people around you. Like, Hey, this is what I do. Um, I'm starting out with this. If you need help, let me know. Um, some people have really, really great ideas and they're just too scared to do it themselves and you can negotiate something from there. Yeah. In terms of, I guess, compensation. So I know that uh, editors, you were saying they either work by the hour usually or they work by the word count. Um, is it pretty much, as you said, wide open for negotiations? Um, is there like a industry standard when you ghostwrite that you might want to come in at, uh, especially if you're, you know, new to it? It entirely depends on the genre, um, your experience, um, mm-hmm. the the readership base that you're writing for. Um, I have been paid anywhere from 6000 a book to higher. Um, some authors only work on a royalty share type thing. Um, okay. Um, so the from the proceeds of the book pretty much um those are usually for those you're going to make about the most money in the first six months um after that book release and then it just kind of tapers off a little bit um so always make sure that whatever agreement you have extends at least to that point um it's not going to matter if it's much further than that um and you're really going to it you only want to do that if you know for sure that the author has an established readership base um if the author has a firm marketing plan if they have um a quantifiable success in in their industry in their in their um genre and their trope that they do write in otherwise you're not going to make much that way that's why editors don't work on a royalty yeah. share basis um but ghostwriting can get extremely expensive it can get i have some friends on speed dial that could charge and have charged about a hundred thousand a book wow yes. wow you're um, signing an nda for sure on something like that one oh, it must be yes. well known yes and okay. a, some of that is more the non-fiction side oh, um really? Oh, uh, celebrity books and things. Yes. Yeah, that, okay, makes, that sense. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah, that would be a really nice paycheck, but I'm not. Yeah. Kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I like how you said it's it's up for negotiation, and maybe that's um, something that I've always thought uh, is that I see sometimes across the board, like, oh, never do this or never agree to that thing, and it's more like, you know what? you're at all different stages of our career and no one set of advice works for it. So at least think out maybe in advance, what are you willing to take? And if you've agreed to it, that's kind of what you agreed to. If it didn't work out great the first time you lived and you learned, and now next time approach it a different way, but don't necessarily think anyone who takes a job for, you know, a royalty or not for this. I'm like how you said there's a, eh, if you're going to do royalty six months after that, you're kind of not really getting anything. Take those into consideration, but it's really whatever anyone wants to offer um, at that point. Yeah, you will. You'll never hear me say don't ever do it because yeah. I, I I don't believe that there's any any directive in it. Ghostwriting is very much like editing. There's no there's no defining governing body that tells us exactly how we need to do things. So, like for me, it was like. Everyone will tell you, don't ever edit for free. Don't do it. Don't do it. Your expertise is worth something. And they're 100% right. What professional editors do is 100% worth every penny. But when you're just starting out, it's really, really hard to put a quantity on your work and to, to prove to someone that you have the worth 
and you are capable of doing what you say. So if you are in a financial position with ghostwriting or editing where you can offer to edit for free or at a very, very reduced rate um, to, to get your work out there and to get the testimonials, those are so important, just like reader reviews. Yeah. Always leave your editor a review or a testimonial something because, you know, they're building their business based on that. And that's going to help that editor, you know, expand their client base. And we're extremely thankful for that. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's whatever you're comfortable doing. It, there's always room for negotiation. There's no black and white. It's all gray. And, and mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing. That's great. Yeah, there's a season for everything. And if there's a season to grow, if you're just starting. Um, yeah, and I just thought about when you said that, I mean, obviously, it's the same. But as a publisher, when we give out or an author arcs, we're, we're giving out basically a free book in the hope for a testimonial. It's really the same thing. So that, that makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Um, Lucy, do you have any other uh, questions that pop up on your radar? I mean, the only other thing is that we haven't really discussed so much is, is your own writing. In your own books. Yeah, that's right. So like, <laughs> yeah, I would like to know your process in terms of your actual books, the genres that you write in, and how you approach editing when you're the author. <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> so I write horror, dark fantasy horror, um, paranormal, cozy mystery, kind of ties in. And then... Um, small town romance. Um, I grew up in a small town, so I have that tie in. And it, it was really funny because when I first started writing, everyone told me that I would be the next Danielle Steele. And I was like, well, who's that? And they're like, oh, she's this great romance novelist. And I was like, ew, no, I don't want to do that. You know, because, you know, when especially when you're in high school, you think of romance novels and you have like, you know, Fabio on the cover. Fabio's on the cover. <laughs> who, who wants to do that? And, you know, at, at that age, I I was adamant that no, no, no. And I rebelled and I wanted to be the next Stephen King. And I was, that's what I was going to do. And so I, I really pushed for that. And um, um, like I said, I usually write about, uh, I write in series just because there is a lot of, um, a lot of marketable value with series. Um, if someone likes the first one, they're going to automatically buy the second one, usually, um, especially with cozy mystery and romance. We have what we call whale readers um, who will go through, and if they like one book of yours that they've that they've read they will go through and buy your entire backlist it's wow. not uncommon and they are the readers that will hungrily you know grab whatever book you publish on its day and it, it's fantastic that's why that genre is as popping as it is um horror i think i think we're getting to that point but i think i think we still have a ways to go um but it, it's definitely a lot harder to market um, horror, um, but I, I always make sure that I work with professionals. That's a huge thing for me. Um, I ran into a couple of times where I bought a, um, a cover for a horror novel and I did a quick search and I found almost the exact cover on another horror novel that had come out a week before. So I said no more. And so now I only, only, only use um, Francois Valancourt. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Oh, yeah. I, I've never spoken to him on the phone. It's always by email, but he epitome of professional. He reads my books before he does the covers for them. Um, he's actually going through my backlog right now and redoing all of my covers to make sure they're more um, on point and exactly what I need for my larger marketing efforts that I have coming down the line. Um, and then I have a different cover artist for each of my genres because just like editors specialize cover artists specialize and so if if they know what works um it's about colors it's about fonts it's about images everything it, yeah. it all matters um you have to get the absolute most 
as you can from that one little thumbnail. And so um, I, I only work with people who do wow. custom covers. It's so much more expensive and I groan about it just like every other author, but it's worth it. And don't tell any other editors, but yes, yes, I do my own editing. I do. Um, that's a huge no-no. Every single editor will tell you that's bad. Don't do it. I do it. Um, <laughs> I do it. Um, but at, at the same time, I put a lot of time and space in between when I actually write a book versus when I when I publish it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times there's I don't know, at least six months between the time that I write it versus when I published it. So I have the time to put it aside. I'm continuing to write. Um, I'm right, like I said, I write three, sometimes four books a month. So it's, it's. <laughs> I'm impressed. I just, I'm just impressed. I, wow. It, it just, your whole entire background is impressive. Anyway, yeah, it, sorry. Uh, it's. <sighs> I'm a glutton for punishment. Yeah. It, I don't sleep. I don't sleep. I have to be reminded to eat. Um, but it, it's it's something. It, it's just like any other writer. I have an inherent need to put yeah. all these works onto paper, and I am absolutely blessed that I that I have as many ideas as I do, and I have to constantly have a notebook with me to write them down or I forget them. And then people hear me grumble for a good month because I forgot. And it's, uh, it, there's never a dull day. There's never a dull day. <laughs> the madness, but a blessing. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Uh, okay. I, I have one more question. And again, I don't know if you can say this because you publish in multiple uh, genres. So I don't know if, uh, are you Lindsay Smith as you write in these genres or are you no. other authors that you don't, you don't discuss? And that's fine. You don't have to, obviously. I was oh, no. just curious okay. because I don't know if you want to promote one of the series or anything and, and that's okay. If you um, don't, but I'm, I'm so curious. Yeah. I am totally okay with, um, well, like I said, I am revamping everything, so okay. don't go out and buy anything. I'm not there yet. Right, right, right. The good stuff is is, is being and, updated. Right. And, you know, I, I've learned that experience is the absolute best teacher. And so I have thrown some things out there just to kind of see what hit, what hits or misses. And before I really put a lot of oomph into a series, um, I, I play around with book launches. I play around with the different, um, like, I don't know, like the, the book caves and the um, the free booksy and bargain booksy and all yeah, of those book formatting. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I've played with all of those and seen which ones work for which genre I write in so I can maintain that constant um, uh, just a book launch schedule because you know I am starting to produce anthologies so I I do want to make sure that I I, I have a value you know I, I am of value to the authors that I work with like it makes no sense to publish an anthology if you're not going to promote it and put it out there so these authors have new readers that come and find them and so yeah. um, I'm really putting a lot of effort into that and so that's pretty much what my last few years of marketing my own books have been. Um, I write under Bella Dean Joyner as my whore. Um, it's funny, my, that's my, my first cat. Her name was Bella. She died a couple of years ago of mammary gland cancer. And so mm. uh, I'm a sucker for kittens. Um, and then Dean was my grandma's middle name. And she was my constant support my entire life. She pretty much helped raise me. So um, she, when she actually got um, dementia and didn't know me for the last 10 years of her life. So that was just my way of honoring her. And then Joyner is the last name of a fourth grade teacher of mine who was the first person who discovered that I had a knack for writing. And so I thought it best to, to make my first pen name all of these pivotal people in my life 
who made me the writer that I am and who put me on my path. Um, and so all of my other pen names kind of spiraled off of that. Um, Caitlin Dean is my cozy mystery name. Okay. And that is one of my daughter's middle names. And then Dean, my grandma's last name. And, and my romance name is Grace Faithlin. And so I have all of those on my website. I, I'm not shy about them, but okay. you know, I'm just um, all of my editing stuff and all of my um, I am going to start producing um, kind of master classes for authors to help okay. them with writing um, different printables that they can have. And so all of that is going to be under Lindsay Smith. So it, it's just easier for everyone to keep everything separate. That makes sense. Um, so your website is, uh, is it lindsaysmithediting.com? No, horrorsmithediting.com. No, okay. Oh, horrorsmithediting, <laughs> code I said. Okay, horrorsmithediting. This way everyone can go there now and check it out. Man, um, wow, that again, I just, uh, I'm, I'm impressed by the amount. And one thing that it speaks to, um, you doing it yourself rather than going to a publisher, um, Lucy and I, I think our very first show was should an author do it themselves or should they get a publisher? And a lot of it had to do with that question of what they want, but you don't get the ability to play around with things. If you go to um, uh, an indie publisher, they're going to have your mm -hmm. one launch and that's kind of it. And sometimes we have to, as a publisher myself say, Hey, do you want to take a chance on this one? I'm going to try this out. Or we're going to try this out, but we only get one launch. And so we try to do it right by the author. But if we've done the same thing a couple of times, it's not working as mm -hmm. a, if you do it yourself you can make that investment and say okay i tried this and that yeah, was a flop but now i'll i'll, I'll change it up you can't necessarily right. do that depending on your contracts if you go with an indie publishing house so um i just right. think that's if you know what you're doing that's the way to route to go yeah but it is great working with indie publishers too um i have a couple of them as clients and mm -hmm. they are great to work with and a lot of them really genuinely do care about you know, they're, they're authors and they want to do what's best yeah. and they have the live launch parties and the the um, the virtual book tours, which I still haven't grasped my head around that yet. But <laughs> like, I, I still have it in my head that when you do a book tour, you know, you go to all these, you know, the Barnes and Nobles and the, the other little mom and pop little stores, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I think I would prefer that, you know, getting to meet my, my readers one-on-one -on -one like that. I think that's great. And I don't, I don't entirely know what you do on a virtual book tour, but you know, they, they organize those and yeah. they, they do pay for your editing usually, you know, and your book cover. So you don't have a lot of that upfront yeah. cost. And I think that's, that that's very needed authors do need that because you guys you you aren't uh, there you know there's that term the gatekeepers and yeah, for the yeah. big five and it, it's so impossible and i was reading something the other day um and maybe it was today my days run together i don't sleep i really don't well, yeah. um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was something about someone submitted a vampire story to a big five and they're like, oh, Anne Rice has done this to death. Like, no. And it was literally the year before Twilight came out. Mm -hmm. wow. You know, so that person, by the time they accepted their book and put it out, that vampire book would have been out during the hype of Twilight, which would have been fantastic for that author. And so, you know, you the the big five they they do gatekeep and they don't always make the best decisions but i think indie publishers kind of take a little bit they take more chances on the books that they really yeah. believe in, and you need that emotion yeah yeah i'm glad you brought up on um, book sends again and free booksy and stuff like that because the you know that was when i had put aside and i got so hung up on working on bookbub over and over again and i got a a foreign book but i didn't get the u.s one and it wasn't as great this time i was like darn it i should have been utilizing some of these smaller tier ones that if you just if you stack them you can really make a huge difference so mm -hmm. um yeah i appreciate that we'll have to have you back on for a marketing one too <laughs> a, a really great um kindlepreneur i don't know are you familiar with 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, it was a YouTube channel, right? And they also have that rocket where you can type in the search words for Perfect. ads. Yes, that yeah. that is huge. Um, but they also, I can send you the link after after this. Um, mm -hmm. They have a updated list that they actually keep updated of the free but also paid book promotion sites, and they keep it updated for all of the ones that are accepting. Um, uh -huh. And it tells you how much they are, um, their their scope, um, like some of them have a wider range than others, so you can better kind of gauge where you want to spend your, your money. Um, some of them say um, if it's by email or if it's by Twitter, and just so you can you can have a a customized marketing plan for you. Because what I do may not be what works for the horror author next to me, which is. Yeah. So strange, but it, it, it's weird how that works. But, um, you know, y you have to do what, what's best and what works for you and what works for that particular book and what you see your readers responding to. And it's so great. It's huge. It's a huge list. But I think that would be really, really great oh, yeah. to everybody. Uh, would love to link it to them. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so thank you again, um, no, Lindsay. Awesome. I really appreciate it. I will make sure we put our or your link, sorry, in the bottom of the show notes, and we'll get that Kinderpreneur. And um, you are uh, l still open to clients, even with all the stuff you're doing? Are you currently accepting, or do you have a re revolution of when uh, you open up again? Um, I am booking in September right now. Okay. Um, so it's I, I do have some spaces, but I have some clients. Like, um, most of my clients are returning. Um, yeah. Some of them only only publish once a year. Some of them publish multiple times a year. And so I, I do keep open spots for clients that I know are about to have a book come or a couple of them have reached out to me lately and told me that they have some things coming. So um, I try to keep my schedule very fluid just to accommodate them. Um, so sometimes I will have open spaces and sometimes I will not. Um, I'm completely booked through July um, and at least the first half of August right now. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm kind of, I'm filling up fast. <laughs> it, it, that, no, well-deserved. It makes a lot of sense. So I guess if authors are looking for the, this is like a book bub deal. They got to start, you know, time it and start, keep saying, are you free? Are you free? And uh, that's fantastic. Much success to you then. And uh, yeah. thank you again for you joining us. Too. We yeah, hope to talk soon. Thanks for asking me. This was so much fun for my first time. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.